Now, let's talk about the disturbances of your esophagus. The, the first disorder that we'll be talking about is your gastroesophageal reflux disease. The description of this disease lies on its name. So you have gastroesophageal reflux disease, meaning there is a reflux of the acid content from the gastro, which refers to your stomach going towards the esophagus. The main reason for your gastroesophageal reflux disease is the weakening of your LES, your LES or your lower esophageal sphincter. So normally, the lower esophageal sphincter on this part only opens when the food comes from the esophagus going towards the stomach. Once the food has entered the stomach, the tendency of your LES is to close. However, in gastroesophageal reflux disease, there is weakness of your LES. And because of that weakness of your lower esophageal sphincter, the tendency is for the contents of the stomach okay, to reflux from the stomach going towards the esophagus. This condition results to inflammatory changes in the esophageal lining. And later on, it results to what you refer to as your reflux esophagitis, which is another name of your gastroesophageal reflux disease. Okay, esophagitis, when I say esophagitis, there is inflammation of your esophagus and that inflammation is caused by your caused by your reflux of acid hence the signs and symptoms related to your GERD one major problem that we have in GERD is the backflow of your gastro the woodenal contents which results to mucosal injury of your esophagus hence the term reflux esophagitis let's talk about the risk factors related to this one is obesity Obesity, because of the increased abdominal fat tissues, may result to increased pressure in the abdomen, resulting to reflux. Other than that, the diet of the patient who are obese may also increase the risk for GERD. Next, we have your peptic ulcer. Then we also have your hiatal hernia. These disorders we'll be discussing later on. We also have pregnancy. What do you think is the reason why a pregnant patient is at risk for GERD? Then we also have diabetes. So in your diabetes, one complication of your diabetes is what we refer to as diabetic gastropathy, which means the tissues of the stomach are already affected because of prolonged high levels of your blood sugar, okay? hence resulting to the damage in the gastric walls. And then it may also result to the weakening of your LES. Then we have your asthma. Okay? The flare-up of your asthma causes the LES to relax. Okay, in other words, if there are bronchial asthma in acute exacerbation, the LES has the tendency to relax. Furthermore, we have connective tissue disorders, which results to cutaneous and GI damages. Okay, for example, among your patients with rheumatoid arthritis, their tendency is that they will have impaired swallowing, hence later on leading towards your GERD. We also have your Sollinger Ellison syndrome. Your ZES is characterized by the presence of acid producing tumors in the stomach. Okay, there are tumors that grow in the stomach, and these tumors are capable of producing several acid. Because of the excess of the acid in the stomach, the tendency is for the acid to reflux. Then we also have your pyloric stenosis. If you can recall the anatomy of your pyloric stenosis okay, or your pylorus, you will recall that once the pylorus is closed or once there is stenosis, stenosis is narrowing of your pylorus. Once there is narrowing of your pyloric sphincter, the tendency is for the contents of the stomach to stay in the stomach because it cannot go down towards your small intestine. Because of that inability of the food to go down or transit down to your small intestine, the food and the acid contents has the tendency to backflow towards the esophagus. Hence, also leading to your GERD. And then we also have your motility disorders. There are disorders which causes slow movement or decreased movement or absent movement of your esophagus and even your small intestines. So later on, these disorders in long term may cause the acid also to reflux from the stomach to the esophagus. If the esophageal peristalsis is impaired, meaning the esophagus movement does not follow that of the gravity, okay, you will have problems of acid refluxing to your esophagus then we have the predisposing factors look at this you have position if your patient has the tendency to bend or to stoop this position increases the possibility of reflux increased gastric pressure in conditions such as that of your pregnancy such as that of your trauma in the abdomen so this can result also to acid reflux 
and then excessive ingestion of food that relax the LES. So what do you think are the food that can possibly relax the LES? And then also the drugs that can relax the LES. Some examples of the drugs are your benzodiazepines. You also have your calcium channel blockers. We have your nitrates, your santines, and then your beta-2 agonists. Other predisposing factors will include diet and lifestyle. That would include the consumption of tobacco, coffee, and then your alcohol consumption, which all leads to increased acid production. Also, the presence of your H. pylori or your Helicobacter pylori in the stomach is a very high predisposing factor towards your gastritis, PUD, and even your GERD or your GERD. Then, the pathophysiologic factors. As I have mentioned, your GERD is caused by the relaxation of your LES. So in this case, inappropriate relaxation of the LES. When is supposed to be the appropriate time for your LES to relax? That will be the time they're in the food from the esophagus would go down to the stomach. However, if your LES would relax intermittently, okay, inappropriately, the tendency is for the acid again to reflux from your stomach going towards the esophagus. Next, there is irritation from the reflux material. The irritation from the reflux material could possibly lead to metaplacial changes on the esophageal wall. Okay, there may be changes on the cell of the esophagus okay, because of the irritation from the reflux material. So normally, the cell of the esophagus could be recalled as squamous cells. If you can recall the discussion in anatomy and physiology, you have your squamous cells. But what happens is that due to constant exposure to acid, there is a tendency for the cell to, be, to change to your columnar, linear, or columnar-lined epithelium. Okay, so it has a tendency to appear columnar. Your columnar could be a pre-malignant state already. This condition is referred to as your Barrett's esophagus. And your Barrett's esophagus is a predisposing factor towards your esophageal cancer. Barrett's esophagus by itself is not an emergency. However, it can progress to cancer. Then we have delayed gastric emptying. The same explanation as with pyloric stenosis. Remember, your pyloric stenosis also result to delayed gastric emptying. Because of that, okay, the stomach cannot empty on time. The tendency is for the acid contents to flash, to flash back or return back to your esophagus. Then you have your abnormal esophageal clearance as one of the risk factors. When we say abnormal esophageal clearance, it means that the esophagus is unable to move its contents towards the stomach. Then... We have the following assessment finding. So when I say pyrosis, your pyrosis would refer to heartburn, burning sensation in the esophagus. You would also have dyspepsia or indigestion. You'll also have your patient report regurgitation. Then you will have reports of dysphagia and odinophagia. Although these terms are frequently used interchangeably, your dysphagia is actually referring to the abnormal transit of solid and or liquid. In other words, there is difficulty in swallow swallowing, I mean. And then your odinophagia is pain during swallowing. But oftentimes, we know these terms are used interchangeably. Then we also have your hypersalivation, increasing your saliva. And then chronic cough at night, especially when the patient is in recumbent position. This is due to the irritation of the acid, especially if your patient is already flat on bed. If your patient is flat on bed, the tendency is for the acid to backflow okay, from the stomach going towards your esophagus. And then your patient presents with substernal or retrosternal pain, I mean, okay, which is atypical. And then, of course, signs of esophagitis. Among these assessment findings, if these assessment findings will continue to persist in your patient, the possible sequelae are as follows. You will have dental erosion, especially if the acid goes back out to the mouth. Then there will be ulcerations. The ulcerations could be on the stomach, it could be on the pharynx, it could be on the esophagus. Laryngeal damage is also more likely to be imminent. Then you will have esophageal strictures. When I say strictures in the esophagus, the possibility of the esophagus to close. Okay, then you will have pulmonary complications. So, these factors or these signs and symptoms, if not managed early, could lead to complications. We have the following diagnostic test for our patient. One is your barium swallow. If you can recall barium swallow, the patient will be swallowing barium for the visualization of your esophagus or your upper gastrointestinal system. 
Then we have your EGD, your esophago gastroduodenoscopy. So this would aid in the visualization of the um, esophagus going towards the stomach and then your duodenum. Then we also have your 24 to 36 hour pH monitoring, again to monitor spikes of the condition. Then you have your Bernstein test. Okay, so your Bernstein test is an acid perfusion test. The first thing that will be done during this test is that a nasogastric tube will be inserted to your patient. Thereafter, once it is inserted, a mild hydrochloric acid is taken. Okay, mild hydrochloric acid that may be in the form of salt water. Okay, uh, mild hydrochloric acid such as your vinegar, I mean. And then this vinegar is usually combined with your salt water or saline solution. And then after the administration of which within 30 minutes, if there are signs of discomfort, you would suspect that your patient indeed have GERD. Okay, your patient would indeed have GERD if this sign is positive. Then we have the, um, this is a picture of your diagnostic test. So this is your EGD. As you can see in EGD, a scope is being inserted to the mouth of the patient and then it will be able to visualize your esophagus and then also the stomach of your patient. It can even go as far as the common bile duct of your patient in the duodenum. So medical management. Let's start with non-surgical management first. So diet therapy is very important for this condition. Okay, Since your problem is acidic in nature, it is necessary that diet therapy will be instituted. So decrease protein in the diet, decrease fat in the diet. Okay, Restrict spicy and acidic food. Eat four to six times a day. Avoid carbonated beverages. And then avoid evening snacks. Supposedly, there is no eating three hours before bedtime. What do you think is the purpose of this? Why our patient need not to take anything by mouth beyond uh, three hours okay, before uh, night time or before sleep time? So try to answer that question. Then we have your lifestyle changes. Okay, that would include elevating the head of the bed when you're sleeping at around 6 to 8 inches. Then sleep in left lateral position. Why do you think we need to sleep in left lateral position? And what are the remedies for us to decrease the intra-abdominal pressure? Then the patient needs to avoid the following. Lifting heavy objects or straining. Okay, bending or stooping position is also not recommended. Then you have your smoking and then you have your alcohol. Then control weight and then bland diet because this has a tendency to be a lifestyle okay, related problem. Then we have the following drug therapy. So you have your antacids, your H2 receptor antagonist, your proton pump inhibitor, and then your promotility agent. For each of these drug classification, I would want you to prepare at least two examples and then be ready to discuss how does this drug affects the functioning of your stomach. Then we have the endoscopic therapies. If you can recall, our main problem is the weakening of your LES. As far as I'm concerned, there is no medication yet that could be given if your um, patient has the weak LES. But we have these endoscopic therapies. One is your straight up procedure. In your straight-up procedure, it inhibits the activity of the vagus nerve, thus reducing discomfort of your client. Okay, I have uh, not personally seen a straight-up procedure, but then the purpose of which is to inhibit the vagus nerve. If you can recall what is the purpose of your vagus nerve, your vagus nerve class is in fact the one that innervates, the one that triggers your stomach for the parasympathetic nervous system response. So if the parasympathetic nervous system response is triggered, what happens to the LES? Will it close or open? What happens to the acidic production in the stomach? Will it continue or decrease? So try to answer those questions. Then we have your enterics procedure. For your enterics procedure and then your barred in the cinch suturing system, the purpose of this procedure is to tighten the LES or the lower esophageal sphincter. And then the goal of these two procedures is to prevent reflux. Okay, guys, the name enteryx and then the name Bard in the cinch has something to do with the branding. At present, there are several surgical kits okay, that can be used in order to tighten the LES. For example, in your enteryx, the way it works is that there is administration of liquid polymer injection. This liquid polymer injection is deemed important to tighten the LES. That's why it's uh, being used by some clinicians. Then, 
you have your surgical management. Okay, the surgical management for your um, GERD is what we refer to as your Nissen fundiplication. So your Nissen fundiplication is uh, considered as an anti-reflux surgery. Okay, it is the gold standard for the management of your um, GERD to strengthen your LES. So it is a 360 degree wrap of the fundus. If you can see, this is the fundus of your stomach. And then what will be done in Nissen fundiplication is to wrap the distal end of your esophagus. Specifically, it is your LES. Okay, so it will do a 360 degree wrap of the fundus of the stomach around the distal esophagus. So this wrapping of the fundus of the stomach to the distal esophagus is expected to tighten your LES. So complications after surgery, small bowel obstruction may occur, retching or the involuntary effort to vomit may also occur. Then we have your gas bloat syndrome, which is characterized by severe air swallowing and enlarged bubble of gas in the stomach. So usually the patient would have shortness of breathing. Okay? Others consider your gas bloat syndrome as that commensurate of your mini heart attack because of the pain that it causes on the chest of your patient. Then we have your atelectasis. So your atelectasis may be caused by hydrothorax or okay, insufflation of carbon dioxide, by which in GI, insufflation of carbon dioxide is uh, commonly done. Then you have your obstructed uh, NGT and your dumping syndrome. Try to read or try to describe dumping syndrome in one to two sentences. Then, so this is how your Nissen fundiplication would look like. As you can see, the fundus of the stomach is being utilized to tighten the lower or distal end of your um, esophagus. And with the aim again to strengthen your LES. Then, this is one effect of your fundiplication. So what are the possible complications of GERD if it's not treated? So you have your esophagitis, okay? So uh, severe inflammation of your esophagus. Then you have respiratory symptoms, possibly because of aspiration pneumonia, because of the reflux of acid, and then the development of your Barrett esophagus or your Barrett syndrome for that matter. So in this case for your Barrett syndrome, your esophageal walls is changed to columnar epithelial cells, and then the tendency of that is that it becomes less effective that is comparable to the tissues inside your small intestine. Oftentimes, textbook would describe it as the change of your esophageal walls to that the same of your small intestine. So again, that is from squamous cells to epithelial cells or columnar epithelial cells. Then, the possible nursing diagnosis for this patient is acute pain. Okay, remember, reflux can cause pain. Then you have knowledge deficit, especially on the compliance and medications, and then on the possible food that they need to avoid, and then the surgery that they need to undergo. And then ineffective therapeutic regimen, especially if your patient does not comply to the dietary and lifestyle changes recommended to them. The next topic that we will be discussing is your hiatal hernia or your diaphragmatic hernia.